Today, we're gonna to be talking about Omega versus Rolex. All right, so Christopher and I have each taken a second to come up with three reasons uh, why we feel one brand might be superior to the other. And for the, uh, the sake of this particular video, I'll be discussing Rolex. I'll be discussing Omega. I do think it's interesting, Jack, that you were only able to come up with three reasons. Oh. <laughs> I have several pages here, but you know, I'll, I'll pare it down to just the okay. top three. Yes, thank you so much. Well, actually, why don't you go ahead and go first. What's your, your first reason that you feel that as a brand, as a whole, yeah. all encompassing, okay. that Omega is superior to Rolex? I think about technological innovation. Always evolving, always getting better. I think about George Daniels' mm. coaxial escapement in 1974, 1975, right? Omega developing their own escapement, efficiency, accuracy. I mean, I understand that Rolex is all like, oh, lever escapement, 300 years old. Mm. I like a little bit more innovation than that. Okay. That's kind of exciting to me. That's it? Oh, no, I also have a, <laughs> there's also, okay, I got one other word for it. All right. That's no, no, okay, I, I just. We're doing. I got one word for you. Mm. Or beyond. I gotta wake up from my nap. Innovation. Innovation. I got one word for you. Innovation. Efficiency. All right, but all fairness aside, I think that there are some comparable traits here. I mean, obviously, if you look at the spread of Omega versus Rolex, like Rolex basically just has core models. Omega, yeah. you have so many different variables, which might be something that will come up later in our discussion. But that being said, like for the Speedmaster in particular, which I think everyone, including you, should be able to agree that's, you know, that's the watch that you think of when it's you think watch. of Omega. They do make those incremental adjustments to, again, the base level, the Hesolite and the Sapphire model. Like, look at the one that just came out, right? They employed the coaxial escapement, which yep. was a pretty big move for them. Changed the bracelet. Micro adjustment on the bracelet. Right, but these are small things. They and that's are. usually what we target Rolex for, right? Is that they make these small incremental adjustments over time. And so I think that that's interesting that there is a parallel there. Yes. Okay, now I'm gonna beat you to the punch. Uh-oh. So, my first reason why I feel that Rolex stands head and shoulders above Omega, and this is coming from a Speedmaster owner, mind yep, you. Yep, good. Is historical significance. Okay. Now, see, I figured you would leave with that one because obviously we're talking Speedmaster, we're talking the moon. I know it's on here. But, all that being said, and I would love to still hear your, uh, <laughs> your reply to this. Okay. If you look at the overarching historical significance across all of the different variables of uh, situations, we talk about the silver screen. Yes. We've got Sean Connery. We've got Robert Redford. We've got Paul Newman. I mean, some of the greatest actors of all time. Yep. Choosing to wear these watches, not just from the casting or the prop department. This is coming from their own personal collector, Steve McQueen. All right, these Deciding are, to wear their own Rolex. Exactly. So, so that's number one. But on top of that, to kind of go toe to toe with landing on the moon, which is a difficult thing to do. That's tough to beat. Right? We've got climbing Mount Everest. Okay. We've got going to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. I mean, Omega can do that too. That's that's fair, but Rolex did it first. You've also got these incredible sporting events that they've been a part of that are a huge legacy, whether it's Wimbledon, whether it's Daytona, whether it's Le Mans. Yeah. So I just think as far as the entirety of history, whereas landing on the moon is no doubt one of the most significant things that mankind has ever done, when you look at the whole scope of things, I think that Rolex has a beat. All right, I'll give you the point for Rolex oh, on heritage if okay. you give me the point for Omega on innovation. All right, Chris, what do you have next? You know, you had mentioned the silver screen. And I cannot help but point out James Bond. Sure, yeah. Right. Omega. That's a double-edged sword, but you go right ahead. All right, I mean, also the best James Bond. <laughs> okay, I'll fight you on that one. Daniel Craig. Okay. All, All right, right. Yeah. Omega. Yeah. Also, Pierce Bronson. Huh? That's the Bond that I grew up with. There we go. So yeah, I, do, I, do have a, I do have a soft spot <laughs> for the old uh, golden eye watch. Yep. That's a great one, yeah. Sure. So I don't know, I feel like if Bond is picking Omega, Rolex. Omega. Beautiful. Or the people who pay for Bond movies are picking Omega. I mean, I I wouldn't mind being like Daniel Craig. Yeah, I can I can I can see your point. Yeah. But remember, the original was a submariner, Sean Connery, Dr. No. So, <laughs> there we go. So next up for me, this comes down to one word. Iconic. Okay. Alright, I think that 
while you could take a dig at Rolex, which I'm sure you will at some point during this video, about the fact that, you know, their watches continue to evolve incredibly slowly, right? The Submariner today looks like a Submariner from 40, 50 years ago. To me, there's something very beautiful about that. And I liken it to the fact that uh, there are certain items, certain physical objects, whether they're architectural, whether they're automotive, in this case, a piece of jewelry, um, that have just stood the test of time in terms of their design. And of course, there's marketing at play with all of these items, but they continue to reach a new generation over and over again as being something that is desirable, being something that has meaning in a cultural significant way. And that to me is so many models through Rolex. Again, it's not just one watch. Sure. It's the Submariner, it's the Daytona, it's the GMT Master, it's the Day Day. All of these watches have had a place in time and a place in people's hearts yep. for again, decades and decades. And that again is a testament, I'm not gonna lie, to the amazing marketing that Rolex does. No, that's true. You know, when I when I talk about technological innovation with Omega being really exciting for me, for mm -hmm. some people, what's really exciting is consistency, is that slow evolution, just like you would yeah. have in a Porsche 911. I wasn't going to say it, but yeah. I'm glad that you did. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I definitely understand that. It is a double-edged sword from the standpoint that there is a ubiquity. Mm -hmm. There is also, obviously, there are a lot of, uh, shall we say, in the very nicest way possible, very heavily influenced watches that yeah. look like a lot of Rolex watches that uh, kind of feed into you know that ubiquity even though they're not actual Rolexes mm -hmm. and and that can be diminishing to some people and unattractive to some people because if you wear a Submariner you might not see another person wearing a Submariner but you definitely if you go out and you're out for a couple days you'll probably see somebody wearing a watch that most people Looks will like wear. right they're gonna think it's yeah. a Submariner and 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 when you get to a certain level I would say of disposable income that's maybe not the most attractive thing you want to yeah. feel like you have something special you want to have something unique but to me a classic is a classic. A classic is a classic, and I think that Omega is maybe going a little bit different direction. You know, they do have the one watch, you know, the one classic sure. iconic watch. You're talking yep. about the Moon Watch, the mm -hmm. Speedy. Um, but, you know, Omega goes in a different direction with the variety. You know, so many watches, so many families that have variety within those families, some families of watches. And I think that that's kind of exciting. It really lets you have a more personal stamp on the watch you're buying, a more personal connection, a little bit more sense of individuality. Yeah, yeah, that's not it's not a bad. Uh, it's not, obviously when you're looking at Rolex, there are a lot of maybe more fun, maybe more different options within the Oyster Perpetual line. They have fun options. Okay. <laughs> well, show the show the celebration. Oh no, no, don't right. do it. Just put it there on. <laughs> do have a point that there there are more options from Omega for sure. Half a point to each of us. Yeah, I think that's fair. For those counting at home, I think that's fair. All right, you got right. Uh, you got, got one more. I got one more. I mean, it's the elephant in the room. Let me ask you a question, Jack. Mm. If I grab somebody off the street and they walk into a Rolex boutique, can they buy a Daytona? No. What about a Datejust? Um, Oyster Perpetual. What about like really, one of the really small ones that no one wants? Oh, okay. Hey, all, right. all right, okay. I got 80 Omegas upstairs right now, ready to walk out the sure. door, just looking for a home. Yep. Okay, availability. Like, we gotta talk about it. Rolex, they do make great watches, undoubtedly. There's a reason why people like them, there's a reason why people wear them, there's a reason why people buy multiples of them and build collections around them. There's a reason why they've stuck around for so long. Okay. But if I want a watch, I want a watch. And I like the idea that I can walk into a place like Shreve I can try on five, six, eight different Omegas, different colors for each of them, different strap options, and I can pick the one I want, I can walk out right now. Sure, yep, yep. and I, I do understand, uh, I do understand that that sense of instant gratification, which obviously, you know, uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, not a dirty word. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's how we've been uh, trained as consumers over mm -hmm. the last 50 years to want something new and want it now. Yeah. But uh, a couple things to, to bring up. Number one, let's talk about market share. Okay. What market share does Rolex have? In the in the overall demand for for watches per annum, I think they hover around two or three percent. Fifty one. I think it's closer to between fifty to fifty two percent. Wow. Yeah. So that, if we just talk sense. about pure demand, yes, they make a million watches they a do. year. Omega makes a ton of watches they as do. well. But there's the simple fact of supply and demand. And I know there, of course, are going to be people out there that are, you know, this is all a conspiracy theory. They're sitting on thousands of Daytonas. They're just picking the right people. And 
Look, we're, we're probably never gonna be able to get to the bottom of that. But just looking at the numbers alone, this is why Rolex is opening up a new factory. Mm -hmm. They're literally going to try and double their output. Okay. Like, you know, because a lot of people would think from a business perspective. Why not just make more? Why don't, they can't. They can't. It's a million watches a year. And that's 51% of the entire global demand for, for Rolex. So there, there is something to be said for the logic in that. Okay. And the other thing that I will say, is from personal experience Tell me. from owning my Rolexes, it's two things. Number one, I was pissed. The first time I walked into an AD, I had the money I'd been saving up for a Submariner. Yeah. That was the watch for me that was my grail when I first started collecting, as I'm sure it is for a lot of people. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And I walked in, I said, okay, I'd, I'd like to buy this watch. Yep. They said, what? Yeah, we don't have any, like, who are you? And yeah. I was complete. I was really upset about yeah. it. But, but two things happened. Number one, it forced me to go check out other brands. Yes. I would never have uh, owned a Blanc Pond, you know, 50 Fathoms, mm. Fathoms Gath. I would have never owned that watch. I would have never owned a Seamaster. Uh, trying to think, I, you know, I did get a Daytona recently. Okay. Yes, hooray for me. Uh, and uh, I, before that, though, before that, though, there were several chronographs that I bought because I couldn't get that that, that piece, right? Well, you, and you have a Speedy. I do have a Speedmaster, yeah. and that was one of them. I had a Zenith. Uh, okay, we're not going to go over my whole collection and my experience. There, there's but what a I'm, video for that. Right. <laughs> but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, even though it's not necessarily the intention, it's probably not what you want as a consumer, it is kind of a blessing in disguise. It's providing an opportunity for you to learn more about right. the industry. Get deeper about... into watches. Yeah. Now, the second thing that I'll say, which I, this is not, you know, facetious here, okay. is that when I finally did get that Submariner, there was such a greater meaning of that watch. That is a watch that I will never get rid of. I'll never get rid of any of these Rolexes that I have waited for and gotten at retail, whether it's been one year or three years, because when you finally get it, which was gonna be my third point, which is ownership, yeah. uh, there there is something that hits in a different way, I would say, than just being able to walk in and buy something. Because you've been thinking about that watch, you've been dreaming about that watch, and uh, when it finally comes to you, when you get to open that little green box, a very different experience than yeah. just walking in, buying a Speedmaster, and going home. I agree. I mean, like I have watches that I've waited a long time for that you know I've researched very well. I've given a lot of thought to. I've looked at the pictures every night before I go to bed and dreamt about them. As dorky as it sounds, literally dreamt about them. Sure. And taken a year before I actually was able to buy it, but they were kind of always available for me, regardless of when I wanted to right. buy them. Right. So overall. You know, I don't know, we can tally up the points. Well, whatever. Anyways, <laughs> thank you so much for sitting through this discussion. Uh, we'd love to know what you think. Are you an Omega fan? Are you a Rolex fan? Do you own some of both? Are you, you know, one way or the other? Please leave your comments below. And if you haven't already, we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel so we can continue making watch content for you. And of course, visit us online at shrevecrumpermote.com or if you happen to be downtown, come stop by our 39 Newberry Street location. Again, I'm Jack Tyler. I'm Christopher Weiss. And uh, we've enjoyed spending a little time with you.